Professor Chen lives on the Tsinghua University campus in Peking. Professor Chen is a member of the small group of elite Chinese intellectuals trained abroad. He studied in Canada and then in the United States during the late 1930s. In 1946, he returned to China. Today, as a renowned professor of physics, he's what the Chinese call a great scholar. In the old days, a pen, a piece of paper, and a book were his entire life. He wasn't interested in anything else. When Papa used to come home, he didn't look at anything except his books. In those days, I believe the American and Soviet educational systems should be our models. So I thought the best thing for our university was to imitate the most famous American and Russian universities. The main characteristic of these universities is that the professors have all the power. As a science professor, I held that since sciences were taught one way in both the U.S. and Russia, we had to do things the same way here. In the past, I treated knowledge like merchandise to be sold to students, and I sold a lot of it. I did all the talking in my classes. I talked, but no one got much out of it. Although I only taught science courses, even my scientific explanations were biased by my world view. For example, I always placed the most emphasis on theory. I insisted upon theory because I thought concrete applications were not very important. And since I didn't stress the practical side of things, my students looked down on the real world. I told them, just learn what I'm teaching you, and I guarantee you your theses will be good. Their only goal was to write a thesis. But the people, because, because of Mao Zedong, studying Mao Zedong's thought had raised their consciousness. So they thought I was really difficult to deal with. And the whole university called me the hopeless case. Not to my face, of course, but behind my back they all said it. So I spent about 20 years like that at the university. In a Western university, my situation might seem normal. But here, in a socialist society, people's consciousness is so high that my behavior was unacceptable. That's why, in the Cultural Revolution, there was a real explosion against me. From the first day, the walls outside were covered with political posters. As soon as I opened the door, that's all I saw. They criticized what I'd said to a given student on such and such a day in such and such a class. These disagreements were inevitable. Then the Red Guards came to the house, saying, we'd like to see if you have any reactionary books. They saw that I did have many books, including foreign books, scientific books, and books on mathematics. They didn't think these books were reactionary, but they asked me, in what way do these books contribute to the economic and scientific development of our country? And since clearly they didn't contribute to it directly, the Red Guards said that they weren't really necessary, although for me they were all treasures. So we had different ideas on this, but they were nice about it. They didn't insist at all that my books were useless and should be thrown away. They just asked me to think about it about how many of these books met the needs of the working class. I thought about this question a lot. It made a profound impact on me. We agreed completely with the Red Guards. They pushed him to change his thinking. At the time, the far left implied that intellectuals like myself would have to leave the university, would be kicked out to go to work in the countryside. I told myself, I'm almost 60 years old, too old for that. If I have to go to work in the fields, I won't make enough to live on. I felt sorry for myself. 
And that was all that mattered. This shows that up until then, in spite of some self-awareness, I was still basically selfish. I was very pessimistic. I heard that there were rumors that I'd hung myself, but I didn't commit suicide. I lived through it all. And why? Well, I thought that since liberation, China had become a great country, which was rapidly developing. I really wanted to see my country progress, and I really didn't want to kill myself. My position in the university was still unclear, but at the same time, I wanted to see my country develop and become more and more wonderful. Shortly afterwards, Chairman Mao called on intellectuals to take part in the life of the ordinary workers, to educate ourselves through manual work. I wanted to go to work in a factory, because that's where the workers are. So I asked to go. The university organized a group of professors who wanted to work in a factory and learn from the workers. My application was accepted. In the old days, I wrote a lot of articles and several books, too. It was signing my name that motivated me to continue writing. Each one of my publications glorified my name. On the other hand, workers never think of signing their names to the things they make. It doesn't even cross their minds. I had a very good education, and all my friends were people like me. I never had workers as friends. I have one son. He went to work in a factory after he finished high school. He's been there for more than 10 years. He went to work in a factory. He didn't want to attend the university. I thought this was a great loss. For me, it was inconceivable that my son would never go to college and would be a worker instead. Only later did I come to understand that he'd chosen a better path than I had. I had taken the road of an elite intellectual, but my son had chosen the road of the working class. He's with the workers, though he's from an intellectual background. Even after he'd become a worker, I kept trying to convince him to go to college, but he didn't have the least desire to do so. For a long time, our relationship was strained. But then, I changed, and I finally gave my son the respect he deserves. There used to be great differences in our thinking. For example, my husband was angry with our son for having discontinued his studies. But the girls and I supported him. My scientific theories were highly respected. I ignored all other ideas. I was very arrogant. But it was at the factory that I realized that all my theories didn't amount to much. I saw there were things that I didn't know because I'd never learned them. But that's when I discovered that I didn't even know things in my own field things I'd studied and taught my students. Well, I hadn't even learned these things very well. For example, one day at the factory, I went on my own to get a piece of steel, a high carbon steel, a type that contains a high percentage of carbon, which makes a very strong steel. I'd never gone by myself to get the medal. I'd always sent one of my assistants down to get it. But this time, I didn't have an assistant, so I went myself. And I didn't have a machine to test the materials. All the bars of metal looked identical, despite the different grades of carbon. They were all dark gray. What was I going to do? What a problem. I stood around looking at the bars, until a nearby worker asked what the problem was. So I explained my predicament to him, and he said, I'll find it for you. He hit the bars with a stick, and by listening to the sound, he found the metal I needed. I was very embarrassed. He said, don't be embarrassed. 
What just happened is an example of a split between theory and practice. You've had this problem without ever realizing it. We knew you had it, and today you've learned it for yourself. It's not all that bad. The Cultural Revolution has set intellectuals like me free. I'm no longer imprisoned by my books. I didn't throw them out, of course. Look for yourselves. They're all still here. And I think my work has improved. That's why I say I'm liberated. It's just one change in my transformation. I've also gotten away from the narrow pursuits of fame and self-interest.